Gonzaga has not lost to Santa Clara since 2011, but a true road came with an NBA caliber guard on the roster. Could make this one a tricky one for Mark Few and the Zags. Let's break it down. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Game Time. Folks, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. We're previewing Gonzaga versus Santa Clara today. We're also going to do our five keys to victory for Mark Few's team. We're also going to close out the show with a discussion on what the Pac-12 Mountain West potential reverse merger is looking like right now and what it might mean for the WCC. All that coming up at the end of the show. But we start getting you all ready for tonight's game. For those of you listening on Thursday, January 11th, the game is at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. It is a road game, the first road game of the WCC season. The game will be on ESPN. No messing around with ESPN Plus. No messing around with Root Sports, KHQ. Nope, this game is on the big one. ESPN, fantastic Uh, exposure. Of course, Gonzaga doesn't really need the exposure, but always good to get WCC matchups on prime time. That is the case here. The Zags, I was surprised when I did this, when I learned this in my research. The Zags currently boast a 26-game winning streak against Santa Clara. They have not lost to the Broncos since 2011, my junior year of college. It has been a long time since the Zags lost to Santa Clara, despite them being one of the better programs in the WCC, particularly in the last couple of years. But really, they've been one of the better teams in the conference for the majority of the Mark Few era, if we're being honest. They've never really been one of those teams way down at the bottom, at least not that to my recollection, certainly not in the last 10 years or so. They've consistently been at least in the middle of the pack in the WCC, and yet they have been unable to find a way to beat Gonzaga. I know there have been some very close games in there. We once talked to former Santa Clara coach Kerry Keating on the podcast. He has some words, some thoughts about some of those matchups back in the day and and how close they truly were. Uh, But as it stands, since 2053 matchups, Gonzaga is 49 and four against the Broncos. They are 23 and one at home. They have taken a couple of losses on the road, and that is what they're going to look to try and avoid on Thursday night. The Broncos, 11 and six on the season. For those of you who listened to Wednesday's show, we did do kind of a a quick wrap around around the WCC, talked a bit about Santa Clara. We'll go a bit more in depth into them here. They started the season out with a fantastic six and oh record. They weren't playing anybody Super notable in that period of time, but still it was good to see, especially with St. Mary's getting off to a rough start, with LMU getting off to a rough start. It was nice to see Santa Clara kind of get off to that good start, pick up some marquee wins. Uh, they've gone five and six ever since then. They are two and zero oh in conference play, but three and six in their final nine non-conference games was definitely a bit of a bummer to end the uh, non-conference slate and kind of be one of the reasons that the WCC has looked a little down this year. Uh, In conference play, they got an 11-point victory at LMU. They also got a six-point victory at Pepperdine. Struggled a little bit uh, with uh, Michael Ajayi. had 27 points against them. He struggled against Gonzaga, but rebounded with a really nice game against Santa Clara. But still, the Broncos 2-0 in conference play. They also have a trio of wins over Pac-12 schools. They beat Oregon, which is looking like a very nice win, as Oregon is one of the few undefeated teams still in the Pac-12 conference. They also have a win, a true road win over Stanford. I don't think Stanford's all that good, but hey, Stanford beat Arizona, so transitive property there. That's a nice win for Santa Clara. They also have a win over Washington State. They also beat Duquesne, who was a quality team in the A-10. They also have a win over Utah Tech, handful of other uh, not particularly notable wins. I think they beat Mississippi Valley State, but everybody has beat Mississippi Valley State. Even Pacific, who granted barely (laughs) beat Mississippi Valley State. 
I also have a couple of good losses. I'm counting Ohio State as a good loss because Ohio State is a, a team that is much better than many people expected them to be. Granted, Santa Clara got beat by 30. Hard to count any 30-point loss as a good loss, but at least it's not a, a bad team that beat them in that regard. They also have two losses to very good Mountain West schools in New Mexico, who beat them by 17. And then probably their best loss uh, on the resume right now is to Utah State, who only beat them by two. Utah State is 15-1 and one on the season and almost, almost got clipped by this Broncos team. For bad losses, they do have a few of those, unfortunately. They lost at Cal. True road game in the Bay Area. It's a little bit understandable. Cal is also much better than they were last year, but being much better than really, really bad still makes them a pretty bad team. And in a loss that for, for a team that beat three other teams in the in the Pac-12 who are all better than Cal, this is a loss that, that stands out a little bit for Santa Clara. They also lost at San Jose State, and that's a particularly rough one. The uh, San Jose State's been a little bit better recently a little bit better but they're still one of the weaker teams in the mountain west and so that's a tough one to take they also lost to yale gonzaga's season opening opponent quality team in the ivy league but not a team that should have beat santa clara another loss that that hurt them and hurt the wcc's reputation a little bit in non-conference play they are currently 115th at ken palm i note this because seattle u is 116th at ken palm seattle u a team many people feel is not good enough to be in the wcc some of you will take this as oh seattle u is a little better than i thought some of you might take this as oh uh, that's just proof that the wcc is not good it's probably a little bit of both as it tends to be uh, but mostly i think seattle u being a top 120 team at ken palm is a good sign for them uh, for santa clara since that's who we're talking about today they are 122nd in adjusted offense Defensive efficiency, 125th in adjusted defensive efficiency. So a pretty equally balanced team in those two areas. From a tempo perspective, they are 84th. So again, not a lot of teams in the WCC that really like to get up and down the floor. They're one of the faster teams from a tempo perspective, but still not a particularly uh, high fly and high octane offense being built by Sir Herb Senda, excuse me, uh, down at Santa Clara. Ken Palm has the Zags favored by just seven in this one. His projected score is 81 to 74. Uh, so definitely could be looking at a much closer game than we're used to seeing in the WCC over the last couple of years. Uh, again, Gonzaga hasn't had a ton of road tests this year. Uh, Washington was the first one. And of course, we know how that one went. Uh, this is going to be another challenging game for, for Gonzaga. P playing a team that, that has the, the weapons, the tools to potentially pull off an upset here. They're a really good outside shooting team. And I think that is always a recipe for success to, to pull off any kind of upset, but particularly against Gonzaga. Now, Gonzaga has been very good at defending the perimeter this year, much better than they are historically, much better than they typically get credit for. But that may not matter in this one. Santa Clara shooting 37.5% from three as a team. That's 36th in the country. Now, they don't shoot a lot of them. And that is going to be kind of an interesting wrinkle in this game, whether Coach Sendek is willing to shoot more threes and, and kind of give his team more of a green light to, to take more open opportunities, which could hurt their percentage versus kind of sticking with the same offense that has gotten them to this point. Uh, they attempt uh, 22 and a half per game, or a little under 22 and a half per game, which is 194th in the country. So again, a top 40 team in terms of percentage, but a barely top 200 team in terms of overall attempts. Uh, the culprits are Carlos Marshall, who's about 48% on about four and a half attempts per game. Adama Ball, who is 41% on four and a half attempts per game. We'll get to him momentarily. And then Tyree Bryan, who is 40.8% on 2.9 attempts per game. I want to talk about Adama Ball here quickly. Uh, he looks like potentially the third consecutive player to get selected in the NBA draft out of Santa Clara. That is unprecedented for a non-Gonzaga WCC school to have that kind of success churning out NBA talent. But Santa Clara turned out Jalen Williams, who ended up being a lottery pick in 2022 and now looks like one of the five best players from that class. He's playing with Chad Holmgren in Oklahoma City. He looks like a, a budding superstar. They also had Brandon Pajemski, who got drafted last year, 19th overall by the Golden State Warriors. He, too, is having an incredibly successful rookie season. Meanwhile, Adama Ball transfers from Arizona, six foot five French, French guard, tons of length, tons of athleticism, tons of untapped potential that he just didn't get a chance to show uh, on, on Tommy Lloyd's team with all the guard depth that they have. Now, so far this season, 16 points, three and a half boards, 
boards, three assists, one steal per game. He's shooting 56% on twos. He's shooting 41% from three. He is shooting 88% from the free throw line. Folks, this dude is good. You know, watch this game t- tonight, and you're going to be like, this dude can really ball. He is very, very talented. Fun player to watch. Could give Gonzaga some fits. Last thing I want to note before we get into our five keys to victory for this game, this team has size, too. More size than everybody in the WCC except St. Mary's, and that includes Gonzaga. They have two seven-footers on the roster, both who play fairly significant minutes. Christoph Tilly was voted as a potential breakout candidate coming into the season by a lot of media outlets. He hasn't quite reached that threshold, but he is a seven-footer. He is averaging eight and a half points, four and a half boards, and about a block per game while shooting 57% from the field. So certainly a quality contributor for this team. Virginia transfer Francisco Cafaro uh, is their other seven-footer, four and a half points, four and a half boards per game, shooting about 55% on those two pointers. They also got Johnny O'Neill, who's six foot nine, but he's a quality rebounder for them as well. Five boards per game, 8.7 points and a little under a block per game. And they don't just have size in the front court. All three of those guards we talked about earlier, Adama Ball, Carlos Marshall Jr. and Tyree Bryan, they're all six, six. So they're going to be playing all those guys at the same time. That is going to make it a matchup nightmare potentially for Ryan Nemhart and Nolan Hickman. We'll talk a little bit about that as we get into our five keys to victory here. Graham E.K. has been a beast lately for this team. His performance, the performance of Dusty Stromer are two of our biggest keys for tonight's game. We're going to talk about that and more after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Folks, maybe you missed out on last-minute Christmas gift for somebody special. Boy, you got to get on that if you still haven't gotten that to them yet. Good news, though, you are in luck with Game Time. Now you can make it up to them by buying a last-minute ticket to a big-time conference matchup with Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. It is exactly what you need, and you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Thankfully, Game Time, they've got you covered. They have deals on last-minute tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It is the perfect place to find last-minute seats. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms do apply. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. All right, folks, we talked Santa Clara in the first segment, their record, their talent on the roster, potential NBA players, how they've done so far in conference play. Now I want to transition to talk about what what does this mean for Gonzaga. What do they need to do to extend this winning streak over Santa Clara to 27? What do they need to do to pick up their first true road victory of the season? We're going to give our five keys to victory here. And it starts with pretty much the same key that we have had for the last couple of weeks, basically every game this season in some capacity, and that's pound the ball in the paint. And look, I know we just talked about the fact that they have two seven-footers, that they have a six-foot-nine player, but this is not a good shot-blocking team. They don't have rim protectors. It's weird that we're talking about a team with two seven-footers in the WCC, where historically there's not a lot of seven-foot talent, but they don't block shots. They're blocking 3.1 shots per game as a team. That is 238th in the country. This is not an area where they really achieve a lot of success. They're decent at altering shots. They're decent at, at frustrating low post players to an extent, but like this is a significantly worse low post defensive team than San Diego state and Graham EK had 22 and 10 or 20 and 10 against the Aztecs. This is not a team, despite the size, despite the, the, the physicality that some of the players boast, this is not a team that is going to have likely going to have a ton of success impacting shots by, by Graham EK, by Braden Huff, potentially by Anton Watson and Ben Gregg, if they're used down on the block, they also commit a lot of fouls. So this is a great game to get Graham E.K. the ball. Every game is a great game. Give the ball to Graham E.K. early. Give him the ball often. Let him go to work on the block. He has been a menace in his last five games. I know there was a conversation after the UConn game where the staff kind of told him, hey, man, we need you to be more of a leader, more of an emotional leader, more of a give me the ball and let me go to work type of player. Like that's who we want you to be. And you can see that that transition has been made for Graham E.K. And he is de- he is de- delivering on that right now. And this is the kind of game where you need to prove it. It's a hostile road environment. They have some size. They have some guys who might be able to alter your shots, frustrate you a little bit. You need to go out there and prove that you can do it. 
And I think this is the perfect opportunity for EK to do that, to score some points early in the game, quiet the crowd a little bit, potentially get some of their bigs in foul trouble, uh, and really kind of establish this team's presence with some authority to start off the game. Key number two, look, this team has a lot of size in the backcourt. And if we, if Gonzaga lets their, their guards get set up, get into their half court offense, they have the ability to, to out muscle guys like Nolan Hickman, guys like Ryan Nemhard, potentially use their size advantage to get some easier buckets. A way to prevent that, get in that press. And I know Gonzaga has been a little bit hesitant to use the press early in games. They don't want to use it too often. I suspect part of that is because playing a press, a three-quarter court press consistently is, is tiring. It causes fatigue. It can cause your offense to be a little bit worse because guys are tired. This team doesn't have the depth to throw a whole new bench unit in there after they run the press for five minutes. So I think that's part of the hesitation. But this is a good game to do that. Santa Clara turns the ball over about 13 times per game. They're roughly average in turnovers. They're a talent guard group, but the best way to prevent them from getting comfortable is to get into that half-court trap. Throw Anton Watson at the front of that one-two, or not the half-court trap, the three-quarter court trap. Throw Anton Watson at the top of that trap and let his length, his athleticism bother those guards. Because frankly, Ryan Nemhard and Nolan Hickman, they're, they're, they're decent defensive players, and I think they're, they're not going to just get worked the entire game necessarily. But the more pressure you can put on those guards by using somebody like Watson, or somebody like Stromer, or somebody like Yo, and putting them at the front of that three-quarter court trap, or even a half-court trap if you need to, just something to force those guards to, to have to look over somebody to not be in a comfortable position with the basketball is going to help Gonzaga potentially get more turnovers or at least force them into frustrating offensive sets. Uh, and more turnovers leads to transition buckets. Transition buckets are vital when you're playing in a road environment. It quiets the crowd. It gets some momentum going your way. For Gonzaga, I think the ability to get transition buckets, force some turnovers is going to be key in this game and an easy way to potentially do that is to use that either half court trap or three quarter court trap another key defend the perimeter we talked about it already with santa clara they got three guys shooting over 40 percent from three they're all three guards they're all three six foot six guards so they got some size some length the ability to potentially shoot over defenders uh, they don't shoot a ton of threes but i think there's a chance that they might get more of a green light in this game i think being able to get a hand in those shooters faces defend if they're knocking them down over your guys they're knocking them down over your guys that's part of how it goes we talked about that a little bit after the san diego game of yeah, the Toreros made nine threes. Deuce Turner made four of them because Deuce Turner's a really good three-point shooter. But in this game, they have three really good three-point shooters. And if you just let them knock down threes, that could cause a problem in terms of uh, potentially causing an upset loss here for Gonzaga. So I think a big part of this is going to be not switching on those screens. And Gonzaga has always not wanted to switch on those screens. But if they do set those high ball screens, they are trying to get outside looks. Uh, making sure they're hedging. Graham E.K. has been very good at that big hedge, making the guards go all the way around him. Ben Gregg is good at that as well. I think if they're continuing to hedge those screens, forcing those guards to go all the way around, if the guards wrap all the way around a screen and hit a deep three, you kind of you, you don't let them shoot those necessarily, but if that's their strategy to beat you, it's probably not going to work. So you'd rather them do that than switching on screens. Having Ben Gregg on Adama Ball is not going to be a good matchup. Ben's a, a tenacious player. He's a good defensive player in certain situations. He's not a good defender in space against guards, so you're going to want to avoid that as much as possible. I think if Gonzaga can stick to their game plan, they should be able to defend the perimeter well, especially if key number four comes to fruition, which is this, this is a, a Dusty Stromer game. This in theory should be an all time Dusty Stromer game. This is his first time playing college basketball in California. He has yet to play in his home state where he grew up, where he became a high school basketball icon. They have not played. Now he is about five and a half hours away from his hometown of Sherman Oak. So it's not like Gonzaga is, is home for Dusty Stromer in this game. When they play at L LMU, when they play uh, at San Diego, they'll be closer to his hometown, but they're at least in California. There's a decent chance Dusty will have some friends, some family, some people uh, in, the, in the arena there at Santa Clara. And for him, this is a great opportunity because like we said, they're playing a group of guards with length, with size on the perimeter. I think this is a huge game for Dusty to stand out defensively, to be frustrating to those other guards, whether he's guarding 
Carlos Marshall Jr., whether he's guarding Adama Ball, whether he's guarding Tyree Bryan, who comes off the bench, like whatever assignment he draws defensively. I'll be curious to see how that looks. Uh, Santa Clara does play Jalen Benj- Benjamin quite a bit. He's a five foot ten guard. So one of Hickman or Nemhart is going to be on Benjamin. Dusty's going to have to guard one of the big boys, though, uh, along with probably Anton Watson, although we will see how that shakes out. But for, for Dusty, this is a big game for him defensively. I don't care if he scores four points or two points or zero points. If Gonzaga wins and he plays good defensively, he gets knocks the ball loose, gets some steals, gets some transition buckets. He frustrates a dumb ball into making mistakes. He cuts off some drives to the basket. He gets his hand and faces on perimeter shooters. If he does that and misses all of his shots, fine, fine. I think there has been a bit of a push for, for some fans to want to see more from Dusty offensively. And I think he's coming and I think it'll get there. But right now, his role is primarily defensively. And this is the kind of game where that length, that defensive instinct that we've seen from him, which is remarkable as a true freshman, that needs to shine because he is vital to Gonzaga winning this game. Key number five is more help from the bench. Ben Gregg's been great coming off the bench. He had that career high game against San Diego, 22 points in that one, uh, set his career high in steals before halftime, monster performance from him. But the bench has been fairly non-existent otherwise. Braden Huff has been fine in the first two games of WCC play at 11 points and four rebounds and nine points and five rebounds against Pepperdine and San Diego respectively. But outside of that, he's had a couple good games here and there, often against, you know, the Jackson States and the Arkansas Pine Bluffs of the world. But when Gonzaga plays better quality opponents, he's not often there in a significant way. Also, the the floor spacing, which was kind of a vital part of his success with this team, his ability to space the floor, shoot threes, pull defenders away from the rim. That hasn't been there. His last made three was December 5th against Arkansas Pine Bluff. He has not made a three-pointer in over a month. He's 0 of 10 since then. It's not like he's been taking a whole bunch of them, but he has not made a three-pointer since that game. Meanwhile, Jun Suk Yao, his playing time has been inconsistent. He only played one minute against San Diego State. Uh, but in his last seven games, he's 6 of 18 from the field. That's 33%. He's 2 of 10 from three. That's 20%. Uh, it's two and a half points, one and a half boards again. The playing time is inconsistent over those seven games. It's a total of 10 minutes per game. He's not, his offense hasn't been a huge part of it. I think for him in this game, if he is playing a role, the hope is that it's defensively. He's out in that press. He's out, you know, forcing turnovers, doing that. Uh, Somewhat similar to Dusty, where you're not counting on him to be a big offensive weapon. But this is a game where Mark Few probably doesn't play a deep bench. That might be okay. They don't have a game on Saturday, so you got an extended gap after this game. Maybe that works in their advantage of only playing seven guys in this one. But it'd be nice to see the bench step up in a, in a more significant way, uh, in, in, if nothing else, at least for some confidence building going forward this season. We're going to close out the show today discussing the Mountain West and whether they might leave some schools behind if they end up merging with the Pac-12, what that could look like, what it could mean for the WCC All that coming up after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the college basketball offers stay hot on FanDuel. And right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. It's $150 in your pocket if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, which include spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Gonzaga remains at negative 175 odds to win the WCC. That still feels like pretty easy money to me. If you agree, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, closing out the show today discussing the Mountain West Pac-12 based on an article read at Oregon Live and based on something else. For those of you who are in the Discord channel, you may have seen this post earlier on Wednesday before recording. I had a couple different ideas for what I wanted to talk about in the third and final segment. And as kind of a reward for those folks who have joined the Discord channel, I put it up to a vote. What topic do you want to hear discussed on Thursday's episode of Locked on Zags? The vote ended up being discussing this kind of Pac-12 Mountain West reverse merger situation. Again, there was an updated article at Oregon Live. It was posted in the channel. There was a very lively discussion about this and what it means for Gonzaga, what it means for the WCC. So if those of you out there have not yet joined the Discord channel, we are four away as I'm recording this from 300 people. Would love to have you in. There's a link in the show notes. It is completely free to join, and then you get a chance to potentially vote on future topics on Locked on Zags and participate in these fun conversations. So the article at Oregon Live was discussing 
the logistics of, of a potential Mountain West Pac-12 reverse merger. I'll briefly explain what that is. It's been discussed a handful of times on the podcast, but effectively it's the idea that Oregon State and Washington State absorb the Mountain West and rebrand the Pac-12. That's why it's called a reverse merger as opposed to an actual merger, which would be the the Mountain West absorbing Oregon State and Washington State. They want to keep the Pac-12 brand. More importantly, they want to keep the Pac-12's assets, which is over $400 million. That could potentially make this merger work. However, for every school the Pac-12 would add into their conference from the Mountain West, they would have to pay a withdrawal fee of $10 million. But each additional school they add after that would cost an extra $500,000. This is per the, the legality, the legal, the, the league's rules, uh, which were obtained by this article for Oregon Live. That means if they were to add six schools from the Mountain West and become an eight-team conference, that would cost the Pac-12 $67.5 million. If they were to add 11 of the 12 schools in the Mountain West Conference, that would be $137.5 million. That is a hefty chunk of change that the Pac-12 would have to pay in order to absorb 11 of the 12 schools in the Mountain West Conference. But if they were to absorb all of them, they wouldn't have to pay those fees. So to me, I think that indicates that this is kind of an all or nothing situation between the Pac-12 and the Mountain West. And part of what the conversation that was being hosted in our Discord channel was and part of where kind of, especially with Oregon State and Washington State joining the WCC is like if these conferences do merge and if somebody like Wyoming or San Jose State or Air Force is left out because they're not viewed as being power six Pac-12 caliber teams, could the WCC then absorb those teams? And to me, this is an all or nothing situation. So I don't see that question being particularly relevant. Yes, there is a very strong argument that somebody like San Jose State or Air Force or Wyoming or Fresno State probably doesn't, quote unquote, deserve to be a Pac-12 school. But who among the current Mountain West schools does? I think you definitively say yes to San Diego State. You definitively say yes to Boise State. They're in a smaller market, but they're a premier you know, fairly regularly ranked in the top 25 football program. They're a good basketball team. I think you take, they're the best, they're the best brand in their state. I think you take them as a comfortable yes in this situation. I think you take Colorado State as a yes, even though they're not a great football school, even though Fort Collins isn't a huge market. You take UNLV, UNLV, even though they're not really good at football or basketball because they're in Las Vegas and that is a monster market. So I think those are the schools that are like, yes, definitive yes. Nevada's probably a yes. New Mexico is probably a yes, kind of same situation, big brand in a, st- in a state uh, where New Mexico State's not at that level right now. New Mexico is a good basketball program. You take Utah State, they're not the biggest brand in their state, but they are a very good basketball program. So I think that's kind of the conversation, though, is like if we're taking Utah State, if we're taking Fresno State, if we're taking Nevada, why would we stop there and leave off San Jose State, who, yeah, is probably below those teams, But if it's going to cost you $100 million to add most but not all of the schools, I think you just take them all. I think you just take them all. You have a 14-team conference. Yeah, some of it's kind of crappy at the bottom. Some of it's kind of crappy at the bottom. But this is the option the Pac-12 has. This is the option that Oregon State and Washington State have. Unless things here break down. And that's where I think the the, the WCC-Gonzaga conversation could come into play. If the Pac-12 schools, if Oregon State and Washington State say, we really don't want to start a conference that includes these schools, you know, whatever schools they have issues with. I'm going to keep saying Wyoming, Air Force, San Jose State, because I think those are kind of the, the programs that are at the bottom of the Mountain West. They could say, well, we don't want to do this at all then. And we're going to continue to maybe keep our relationship with the WCC extended beyond two years, which is what it's currently written as. Could they try to take just a, a smaller portion of those Mountain West schools. Maybe they they say, hey, we're good taking six. We're good taking San Diego State, Boise State, Colorado State, Nevada, Utah State, UNLV. We're good taking those schools. And we're also going to look to add some schools out of the WCC. Or we're going to look to add North Dakota State and South Dakota State, which are bad basketball brands, but are very good football brands. Maybe they look to do that. Maybe they look to invite Gonzaga and St. Mary's out of the WCC as basketball only schools. They could do that while taking North Dakota State and uh, South Dakota State as football only members. I'm not saying these things have are, are necessarily likely. I'm not saying these things have even been proposed. I'm saying there are options. 
that this Pac-12 Mountain West reverse merger situation could entail. Because taking six schools out of the Mountain West costs you $67 million. That's not cheap, but you got $400 million in assets. You can, you can afford that. You can afford that while also paying whatever the exit fee would be for North Dakota State and South Dakota State, which is probably limited, uh, and, and give, extending an invite to Gonzaga. I won't spend a ton of time on what that would look like for Gonzaga because we're running low on time. If you've listened to old shows, we have talked about this. The very shortened version explanation here is this. A Mountain West Pac-12 merger in that situation is more appealing to Gonzaga than the current iteration of the WCC, but it is not more appealing to them than the Big 12 or the Big East. And unless there is a 0.0% chance that the Big 12 and Big East are extending invites to Gonzaga, and it's literally 0.0, I don't think Gonzaga would accept an invitation into this Pac-12 Mountain West uh, merger situation. I don't think they would. Maybe if it's 0.5, they might. But honestly, if they think there's any chance the Big 12 is going to come knocking, if there's any chance the Big East is going to come knocking, they're not going to join another conference. So that's where I think this is at in terms of Gonzaga. But it is certainly a situation worth following in terms of what it means for the Pac-12, of course, what it means for the Mountain West, what it could potentially mean for the WCC as well. We'll be back on Friday with, of course, a recap of this game against Santa Clara. We got some recruiting updates to get you out into the weekend as well. I want to thank all of you for making Locked on Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. And until Friday, as always, go Zags.